My God, well done to Alt and the organising committee. Come on, what a place. What a place. Taking at the London Palladium. Absolutely brilliant. Um, once again, I'm delighted to bring, to bring back the madness that is Gosta, and even better, we have three sessions. Anybody at Gosta last year in Manchester? Excellent. So, do you remember how to count an Irish? The whole thing about Gosta. It's an Irish word, it means quick or chit, very quick, it's sort of like Petra Kucha, but much better, like on sort of, of steroids and Guinness and everything else. So the whole idea of this is, is five minutes, and I mean five minutes. How often have you sat there, particularly if you're the last presenter, and you see your time has been eaten away? Well, that doesn't happen here. Oh no. Five minutes means five minutes. Now, the worst of it is, you know, so, some of the English people, you're so nice and well presented, you actually stuck to the five minutes. That's not really the fun. The fun part of it is what the crowd gets to do. You all count in Osquelga in Irish, it's also Scots Gaelic. One, two, three, four, five, and then you'll shout out Gosta. I'll teach you to count. But even better, when we shout out Gosta, the five minute, the clock begins. Larry Phipps is here and he's going to be counting out. I will walk up beside you when 10 seconds are to come. When the five minutes is up, I will call to the crowd and you have to then count in Irish again. One, two, three, four, five, and then start, which means stop. That's it. It's abs. Oh, yes. It's a sort of academic blood sport. <laughs> but there is a serious thing. We're trying to get a lot of messages in. People have done some great work, so I would really always encourage people, if, you, if, if one of our presenters here has said something which really sparks your interest, please do come and chat to them afterwards. Very quickly, we're going to teach you how to count in Irish. Number one, a hain. Oh, lads, that's pitiful. Will we try that one again? A hain. Number two, a doe. A deer? <laughs> now here's a very complicated one. Three. <laughs> now it gets better. Number four, cahar. Five, cooig. We'll try again all together, starting one, two, three, four. Ready? A hain, a doe, a three, a cahar, a cooig, and then we shout gossa after that. Are we ready for our first victim up here? Sorry, presenter. And then don't forget, when 10 seconds to go, I'll come up here, and when I wave to the crowd, we'll all count a hain, do, three, kahir, kuik, and stod. And it means stop. Are we all ready to start the count? Are you ready? <clears throat> go. Ask Greg at the five, and then roar out gossip as loud as you can. Are we ready? A hain, a do, I didn't fly over from County Cork to hear this pitiful rubbish. Are we ready? A hay, a doe, a tree, a car, a cooing, Gosta. So lecture capture um, is something that's becoming <laughs> becoming essential in university teaching. Um, and we know, we've heard already about lots of universities which are rolling out lecture capture um, across their campuses. Um, uh, but a lot of this is a lot of, a lot of the literature and a lot of this thinking is predicated on the idea that lectures have a very traditional format. In other words, that the lecturer spends most of the time talking and the students spend most of the time listening. But actually, this often isn't the case, and that's particularly in physics, um, other sciences, in maths. Often they use flipped or active learning approaches. And that's what this research wanted to look at. Um, how does the pedagogical approach affect how students use lecture capture? This is an image taken from um, physics, um, active learning, flipped class. In these classes, uh, the students are asked to do pre-readings and short quiz before the lecture. So these, these are pre-readings and not videos. About 50% of the lecture time is then spent actively engaging with the material. So that is talking to each other, um, doing problem solving, interacting with the lecturer. The, in contrast to that, the non-flipped classes, the traditional classes, are where um, students first encounter the material um, during the lecture itself. 
And we used a multimodal approach to investigate this. Here are two of the key themes um, from student interviews. And actually, the first thing that we found was that students really wanted to be in the lectures if they possibly could. They couldn't always. One student had to have a grand piano delivered from Denmark, but these things happen. Um, the, one of the, the thing that they often said was that they preferred to be in lectures and there was an extra impetus if there was added value in the lecture. And the two things that added value for them were peer discussions, where there was problem solving in physics or in maths, and also demonstrations in physics. The other key theme that came out was that multitasking was hard. And this was quite interesting because we're sort of led to believe that everyone nowadays can, can spend all their time multitasking. But actually, they found it really difficult to listen to the lecturer at the same time as making notes. And this was particularly hard where there was a lot of new information in the lecture. And the result of this was that students needed to go and visit lecture captures. They either needed to use lecture captures to write notes because they'd been concentrating on listening to the lecturer, or they needed to um, listen to what the lecturer was saying because they'd missed what the lecturer was saying because they were writing notes. And the implication of this is that for classes that are very information dense, and that tends to be the traditionally taught classes, lecture captures are going to be more useful. In contrast, the, non, the, sorry, the flipped classes, where information tends to be presented before the lecture, are going to be less, students are going to use lecture capture less in those classes. That, that's the implication from the interviews. And we found that this is actually what we found with the quantitative data. So in the red box, what we can see is the average number of minutes that students spent watching lecture captures over the course um, of the semester. And the first, uh, first number there is for a non-flipped class, um, and that's 111 minutes. And you can see that for the two flipped classes, the, the, the amount of time spent watching lecture capture was about half. So a lot less time spent, to, spent using lecture captures. And what are the implications of this? Well, the first thing is if you care about student attendance, and we can discuss the, the merits of, of student attendance in lectures, if, if you do, then think about ways to add value to your lectures. It needs to be for them, for the students, a different experience to actually come to the lecture compared to watching it sitting at home. And the other thing is, think about the density of information in your lectures. And I know that a lot of courses do have a lot of uh, information, a lot of course content that they need to get through during the course of the lecture. Um, but if there's going to be a lot of information, a lot of, dense course, uh, a lot of course content, um, and it's too much for the students to take in during that lecture, and then they're going to the lecture capture, is that the best use of their time? Um, so those are some of the implications. I'm going to finish this on well before five minutes by the look of it. <laughs> That's not the idea, I, I, I know. Um, anyway, do, <laughs> do, come and, do come and talk to me. Um, those are my contact details. We have a preprint of uh, the qualitative stuff available um, there, and we have, there's a poster outside. Sorry about that. <laughs> well done. Not easy. Four minutes and 45 seconds. Boo. There's no fun if there's no blood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's Jordy time. It had to be you, didn't it? Are we ready? Yep. Are we ready? Now, that was pretty good counting. Now, this time we'll have a little bit of a competition. Left and right. We'll start off with Hain, Doe, Tree, Carr, everybody Cooig, and everybody Gosta. Are we ready with that? Starting with the left. Uh, Hain! <laughs> the whole idea of Gosta is a little bit of blood racing through. Already, within a millisecond, you'd already fallen behind them. Are we ready? Uh, Hain! A uh, Tree! Carr! Akui, Gosta. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Suzanne Hardy. I'm from Newcastle University, and I'm the Learning Enhancement and Technology Projects Team Manager in the Learning and Teaching Development Service. Uh, my talk is about implementing the TEL roadmap, but the first thing I'm going to say, it's not a roadmap. Uh, and I'll tell you why as we move through. Uh, it is a road to somewhere, 
and uh, we do know the route that we're going to take. Um, so this is about a five-year project leading up to a five-year project. Um, it takes a long time to change things in traditional universities. So let's go back in time. And I've got a little timeline for you. <clears throat> four years ago, four or five years ago, we started a tell roadmap consultation with all staff in professional services and academic services at the university. And, uh, and we asked them what they needed to use more technology in their learning and teaching. And we did a series of workshops. We went to every school. We invited everybody that we could think of who was involved in learning and teaching, programme administrators, people from the exams office, NUIT, everybody. And we, all, and we asked them all the same questions. And they were really active workshops. We did loads of them. I think we must have done about 50 or 60. There was loads of them. Uh, so we consulted with everybody in the world. And, and what they came back with was that they didn't need more technology. This might seem familiar to some people. We were kind of expecting them to say, we want loads more things to make more content. No, we don't need more technology. We need help. We need to know what's possible. So we listened. We've now got a five-year plan, which started last year in 2018 and runs until 2023, which is um, a significant amount of money that's been uh, endorsed by council and Senate. And it's come from the bottom up. We've taken from what those people have said and we've based the new policy, we've based the plan, we've based the projects on what people told us. So they don't want technology. The project's been top up and bottom down, and I think uh, we're in early days, but I think we're starting to see the results of, uh, of the approaches that we've taken. So we had a new university vision and strategy launched in, on the 1st of October last year, and the second thing the Vice-Chancellor talked about was he wanted Newcastle University to become known for its uh, excellent blended learning for on-campus courses. That's massive. We're a research-intensive university, and the second thing the VC said was he wanted us to be known for blended learning in campus-based teaching. Wow. So we knew we were onto a good thing there. Uh, you can see here that we've got education for life and research for discovery and impact as parity, and we have this phrase within the University of parity of esteem for research and teaching. Um, and we have uh, promoted several people recently to professors for, who have, uh, based on the quality of their teaching. We even have people who are the heads of school who have come from a teaching and uh, pedagogy, teaching and scholarship background rather than research, which is, for us, massive. We've got four strategies within that vision, education for life, research for discovery and impact, engagement and place, and global. And educational for life has this, uh, one of, it's got four key themes, and this is the fourth key theme, an educational experience supported and enhanced by technology. So as well as really good things that have been happening in the Faculty of Medical Sciences for years and years at Newcastle, um, we've got things, pockets happening all over the university, but we now have a strategy that says that, that this is going to be part of what the university is known for. I'm not going to read this out, but to deliver this uh, technology-enhanced educational experience, we, we do these things. So we want to work across programmes. We want extra and co-curricular opportunities for students. We want to embed the effective use of technology-enhanced learning in our programmes. And uh, we want to provide high-quality and sustainable support to staff, which is what they said they needed. So 11 months in, where are we? Uh, in March, I had three new staff join my team. In September, uh, I had two start this week, and I've got another one starting later on this week. And uh, we're just about to advertise two new posts. So I've gone from a team of two. Soon I'll have a team of ten. Uh, we have six major blended learning projects underway, two per faculty, because we have to be fair. Um, and they are major. So uh, we're working with the two biggest schools in the university, the Business School and the School of Engineering. We've got several smaller projects, and we've got a queue of people who want to work with us. And we're also offering programme review support. Again, this is something that's written into uh, the policy. And of those, we've got six. Uh, we're also showcasing and upskilling people through a programme called In the Art of the Possible. Pain. But the Go. next chapter, Three. come back next year. Fire. Thank you! Oh. <laughs> I don't know if that was a job, advert, or a presentation. <laughs> now, cardiovascular exercise is very good. Very good for the mental and physical health. 
So I'm going to ask you to do, as we do our countdown, something unfathomable. Put down your phones and your laptops for a few seconds. What we're going to do is a little bit of exercise. Just get the blood flowing. It's been a long, long day. And we're all ready here. <laughs> so this time, we want all the hands up in the air. And we're going to start off to your left, the Hain Doe. Are we ready? Get the hands up. Get the hands up. Even the posh people up the back. That's it. Oh, is that you can rattle your jewellery? Are we ready? Start and go to swing to our left. Are we ready? Are we ready? Yeah. <laughs> a Hain. A Doe. Three. Come on. A Cahar. A Kuig. Gosta. So for the past three months, I've been working as an intern for the University of Edinburgh, working on a project that is aimed at geographically locating and visualising information from the Survey of Scottish Witchcraft Database. This database has all of the records of accused witches in Scotland from 1563 to 1736. And over this time, the database has collected a lot of geographical information and I've been trying to locate this. And I've been uploading this information onto Wikidata, which is Wikipedia's sister project. And by doing this, I've learned a lot of new skills and seen the power of Wikidata. Um, so, um, the main part of the project was to be able to geographically locate the different places of residence for the accused witches within the database. And from this, there were a total of 341 different accused witches that all had places of residence recorded. And then there were a total of 822 places of residence that were noted within the database. So my job was to be able to locate all of these different places and link them up to the accused witches. So some of these places already had items on Wikidata. However, there were many of them that still didn't. And so I tried to locate 500 of the different places using a variety of different historical sources. The main source that I used was the Ordnance Survey First Edition map, which has been digitized and uploaded onto the National Library of Scotland. For this, I've been able to search the different place names from the database and be able to find them on this map and add it onto Wikidata. Aside from that, I've used place name books, gazetteers, and other experts in place names to find these places. In the end, I was able to locate nearly all of these places and add them onto Wikidata and link them up to these accused witches. Aside from this, I then had time to be able to locate other parts of the information that have been mentioned in the database, such as trial location, detainment location and death location, and these have all been added for the accused witches. There's also been information about the people related to the trials and their residents have also been located. There's been a wealth of information within the database that could also be added onto Wikidata, and properties have been added such as trial types and the different torture types and ordeal during the trial. These then can be searched using the Wikidata query service and this is used with basic knowledge of Sparkle in which you're able to then search for different things that you're interested in and this will be able to give you a list of, for example, all of the different accused witches and their place of residence. And with this query, I've then been able to use it for different types of visualizations. And these have all been hosted onto the witches.is website. From being able to use the Wikidata query service, we've been able to make visualizations using Leaflet, such as this map here, um, in which we've been able to use it directly. There's also been other maps being produced using ArcGIS Online by downloading the information into a CSV file and uploading it onto the ArcGIS system itself. In the end, we've been able to make many different visualizations and show just what can be done with Wikidata and with this data set. Well done. Putting them all to shame you are. Brilliant, well done. And I have to say, Ewan, what a job title. Wikimedian in residence. I mean, how cool is that? That's, I, that's must be the coolest job I've ever heard. 
Now that was pretty good uh, cardiovascular. We'll be ramping it up. Not this one, but the next one. But we're getting the arms back up again. Hands up again. Get them up. Get them up. Are we ready now? One, lads. I can hear myself. I can't hear you. Actually, do you know what? I'm not sure even going to do the count this time. You're going to do it. I'll start off hanging, and after that, you're on your own. <laughs> I'm going to take the training wheels off. Are we ready? Ah, uh, hey! Okay, I'm uh, Anne-Marie Scott, I'm from the University of Edinburgh as well, and I want to talk about a short project that we did this year looking at improving the accessibility of some of our media content in the university. Um, over the last few years, we've put a lot of time and effort and care into um, building up the collection of media that we have in the university. Um, and if you go to media.ed.ac.uk, you will find a, a smorgasbord of interesting things. Um, but with the recent changes in legislation in 2018, um, around accessibility of content, which actually, as we all know, build on previous legislation, we're starting to uh, think about the challenge of how to make a lot of this content more accessible. Now, some of it is accessible, but the vast majority of it isn't, and I think in terms of subtitles, for example, and I think that's probably a challenge that lots of us are facing. Um, and so we started thinking about how could we work out how to, how to solve this problem. Um, it's an expensive and big problem, and it's one that we know a number of people are grappling with. Um, and as we started to pick into what kind of services are available, what might technology do for us, we started to feel a bit uncomfortable. We started to think about well, where does the audio track go? When you start looking at subtitling services, they're presented as software services. Um, you, you magically send your, your video or your audio file away and something happens and then it comes back with perfect subtitles on it. Um, how does that happen? Um, where does it go? And we know that uh, it's a number of our staff are a bit sensitive already about who gets to see private content, research seminars and so on. Um, and so we, we picked into this a bit more and we had a chat with some of our colleagues in the School of Social and Political Sciences, one of whom researches in the gig economy. And we started to learn a whole lot about the, the gig economy around transcription services. And then we started looking at the costs that we were being quoted and we did some maths and we looked at what the fair living wage was and we realised that the vast majority of the work that's involved, because there's human work involved in getting to perfect, perfect subtitles, is typically being done piecemeal and offshore. Um, and it starts to get very uncomfortable then as an elite Western university to improve your accessibility by spending your money on precarious labor and uh, outsourced precarious labor in other countries. So we weren't feeling super comfortable about throwing lots of money into a project to get lots of subtitles generated for our, our content, no matter how easy that might seem to be. So, we decided to run this pilot project to try and move ourselves forward and understand what the other options might be. Um, so we had three strands in the project. Um, the first one was to think about how we could improve digital skills and promote culture change across the board, because trying to improve the accessibility of our content in a way that we can afford is almost certainly going to involve spreading the load across the institution. Um, and then we thought, well, if we're going to have to employ people to improve the quality of the subtitles associated with our media, why don't we see whether this is work that our students might want to do? Um, and again, as we started to think about what that work was, we realised that it might actually be particularly interesting or particularly attractive to certain types of students. So if you um, if you're maybe can't afford to travel all the time or you have caring responsibilities, it's work that's really flexible. It's work that you can do from anywhere. It's work that you can do comfortably from your own home, potentially. So it might offer employment opportunities where they're maybe not otherwise available. And then we thought, well, you know, we have a world-class school of informatics and speech recognition and speech processing colleagues. So we should probably go and have a chat to them and see what the state of the art is as well and see whether perhaps there's something coming down the line in terms of the technology. So the project had these three strands. Um, we ran it for 12, uh, 12 weeks. We had student subtitlers working with us. Um, we ran two symposiums, um, one to do a kind of state of the art of the technology and one as a wrap at the end of the project. Um, 
And we gathered quite a lot of data as we went through this subtitling process with the students. So the key things that we learned, first of all, we learned that the technology isn't as good as we think it is, um, is transcription technology, and that there's probably a particular challenge for the education sector because where we had the most, where we had to spend the most time subtitling was inevitably where the sound quality was poor, where the person speaking maybe wasn't a native English speaker, or where there was specialist terminology. And I think I've just described every lecture theatre in, in all of our institutions. So there's a particular challenge in this space the technology might improve, but probably for educational use, we are going to be at the very, very end of, of the line here. Um, other things we learned, students want this work. They enjoyed doing this work. They found working for a university supportive. And I'm going to get hey, called. Hey, <laughs> and I've got a poster downstairs if you want to learn more. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to see transcription services for Fad or Jack or something like that might be uh, might have been useful. All right. Yep. Just get yourself set, set up. I'm good. Yes. I'm You're ready. ready to go. No, actually, I'm not. No. Ah. ah. <clears throat> Are we ready to, instead of going hand on three car Coog, are we ready to go Cooey car three? You're not. No? No? I'm not, so we'll stick with the normal one, so. Okay, now this time, we'll do a bit of leg work as well. So we'll stand up on the hand, then do, three, car, Cooey. Okay, so we up. So up on the hand, do, three, car, Cooey. Are we ready? A uh, hand. No, that's 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 <laughs> People in the posh seats again. You're also part of here. You paid double the price. I think you should be much more part of the whole ambiance. Are we ready? A hen, a doe, a tree, a car, a cooig. Gosta. Okay, thank you. My name is Stuart Allen. I work for Edinburgh Business School, which confusingly is not part of Edinburgh University. It's part of Harry Watt University. And feel free to boo at this point if you're from the University of Edinburgh. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that we've been running. Um, I'm not going to go through the research that we did and how we analysed it, because that's all... It's not really in this paper, but it's in, in this poster, rather. It's in the full paper, which you can access using the QR code, which is also on the poster, which is downstairs. So I'm going to try and spend the bulk of my time talking about why I think you should do that and why I think what we looked at was an important issue. So when we talk about building physical spaces in higher education, we talk about investing in the student experience, and, and, and rightly so, and we, and we create bespoke spaces that are tailored to our students' needs, and we ask them and we involve them in that process. But when we come to build dis digital spaces for education, we often talk about it in terms of cost or risk. It's often not seen as an investment. Um, and I suppose that's one of the issues that I'd like to, like to flag here, because that was one of the things that, that came up as we were running this project. So when we, build a, when we do campus-based education, we don't hire a football stadium or a, church hall or a room above a pub, we, we build something. And uh, I'd like to try and uh, further that narrative into digital spaces as much as possible. And this is actually a, a, a social justice issue, I would argue. I work for an institution that has one in four of our students live in Africa. Uh, we did lots of research with them, and they told us that many of them didn't have internet access all of the time. And actually, when systems, digital systems are built for the West and they're built for Europe and America, they're not built with those people's needs in mind. So we spent a lot of time asking our students what they needed, what access they had, and what kind of experience they were looking for. So as, as this quote said, until you involve the people who are being marginalized in the development process, then you will continue to marginalize them. So we did what everybody else does when they look for a new environment for digital education. We, did, we looked at the big VLEs and we did a procurement process. And what came back out of that process was that there was a clear winner and we chose Canvas. 
Um, but none of the systems did exactly what it was that our students were asking for. And there was a number of compromises that we felt we couldn't accept, and that our students couldn't accept. There was a lack of offline capability. Um, surprisingly, there wasn't full mobile optimization across every page and every section. And a lot of our students have skipped computers and gone straight to mobile. And also, content is kind of siloed by, you've got discussions over here and text over here and questions over here. And our students said to us, we're really time pressed and we want you to try and curate a path for us through this material that doesn't require us to click around all these times. And, and really what we were trying to do was to, to respond to those needs and respond to people who were otherwise going to be marginalized. So we spent a long time developing a, a custom built platform. Again, you can look at the full paper if you want to find out more about it, but basically we use Canvas as an authoring system and we integrate that with lots of other bits of smaller pieces of software underneath a, a custom built user interface. And that's only, that was only possible for us because we have an excellent team of software developers who work with us and we were able to get a budget to go and do that. But the risk to us of not doing that was extremely high because people who had had access to our online education before when basically we provided materials in PDF format and as, and as e-books would justifiably have said to us if we just adopted a system out of out of the box, well, how do I access this offline? So the risk of, the risk of not doing something, um, not doing something for students who would otherwise be marginalized was uppermost in our mind. So I'd like us to try and imagine a future where um, this is possible for more people. It was, it was possible for us because we had capability in-house and we had people with imagination and, and uh, who were brave enough to go and take those risks. Um, I'd like to imagine a future where VLEs are unbundled, so the, the vendors break down what they have into smaller pieces, where procurement is more granular, where institutions can take this approach and they can take a, a system for forums and they can take another bit of software for um, content authoring, take another system for webinars. I'd like to see how that's possible and we all have this kind of expertise in-house. And so really my uh, my message is that, that can we start talking about building our technologies for our students? Three, car, cooing, stop. Thank you. So we're nearly there. Now, the people in the cheap seats can take a break now. We're going to have all the lords and ladies in all the private boxes up the back do the counting this time and then I want then the so I think there's fewer of you but I think I, I think you're going to make some big noise there some big people big positions big money sitting up the back and you can just but then the next time then the cheap seats will be given a competition and be like Huey Green and I'll be making a decision about who who, who costed the loudest so we'll just start out only only the people in the in, in, in the posh seats and Open the boxes. We just did accounting. I'll start you off with Hayne, but after that, you're on your own. Are we ready? Uh, hey. No. That's not ready. No, no, no. No, I think you, you sort of knew the response there, wasn't it? But we try that one again. And like that, have a bit of pride in yourself. Okay? Bit of pride. Okay? It's pretty shambolic. We try that again. Pride. We're ready? Uh, hey! Hello, I'm Tara Hawes, and I work for Coventry University Online, seconded from FutureLearn, and I'm going to talk about how at Coventry and Camden we're using learning technology for wider impact. Um, so just a bit about FutureLearn and Coventry University Online to start off with. Um, I'm probably going to zip through the case study because I don't have time um, and move on to the lessons learned and the next steps. So the partnership between Coventry and FutureLearn was launched in 2017 and as many of you are aware it was quite controversial at the time. 
Um, FutureLearn has hundreds of partners around the world, ranging from some of the world's top universities to people like the British Council. But at the time, it was solely owned by the Open University. So as someone who left the OU to go and work for Coventry University Online, that was quite a controversial move at the time. Um, since then, Coventry University Online has had 152,000 enrolments. Um, the learners from 221 countries, the last time I checked, and we've launched 15 degrees and 66 open courses and their respective programs, because every open course is a taster for a program of a degree. Um, so I was going to do a case study of MSc nursing until I got stuck into things and realised I wasn't really going to have time to talk about that. So if anybody is interested, I will be uploading the slides and please do come and say hello and have a chat about things. Um, the two open courses are Nursing in Crisis and um, Healthcare Research. And the reason I found them interesting was because I was the project manager who first set them up and they were the first open courses we launched on the platform. And healthcare research, for example, had over 2,000 learners from 131 countries. So I felt that really fitted in well with the theme of using learning technology for wider impact. Um, and also the MSc nursing, because of course they were taster courses for the MSc itself. Um, at the moment we've got 12 students and we're about to have our first graduates in July 2020. Um, but in a room full of learning technologists, I'm sure you're curious to hear what learning technology was actually used. So the main medium in terms of technology is actually video. Um, we have a studio full of digital media developers, and their main role is to shoot and edit video content. Um, it's all optimised for mobile devices, so there's a bit of attention going on there, as I'm sure you can imagine. And the FutureLearn platform itself has got a certain pedagogy, which is very student-centric. Um, it involves storytelling with big questions. Um, it encourages social learning, and it, and it actually creates a space where we can have international communities of practice. Um, and it's about developing skills and celebrating progress. And it's very use, easy to use data and analytics to determine wider impact. And we also use tools such as peer review, group work, and portfolio tools with various rates of success. Um, testing for effectiveness is actually quite simple on the FutureLearn platform. It's really easy to get your data and analytics. There's facilitation dashboards. It's easy to track retention and completion. You can get statistics for each step. And of course, you've got the wonderful luxury of immediate learner feedback. Plus, you can map the learner journey and we've also started doing focus groups. Lessons learned very quickly. Um, the big questions do create stimulating debates. Um, it leads to social learning, and I've got some great examples of international, international communities of practice, if anybody would like to hear them. Um, we've gone through with the nursing courses and the initial case study, and we've actually opened up the questions more so that runs two and three have been updated to encourage more discussions. Um, media, less is definitely more for practical reasons as well as pedagogical ones. And we've learnt that peer review and group work can be very unpredictable. A lot comes down to the cohorts of students on those particular degrees or those courses. And as I'm sure most of you are aware, third party tools can be pretty risky. Um, some more lessons learned. Two, potential for greater use of learning technology. I'd really like to start using more social media to see how those can, uh, that can build communities. Um, and also one thing we've learned is that being agile doesn't always help you go faster, especially when working with academics. And if you make enough courses, will they join? Will they pay to do a degree? Next steps, wider impact. Please do come and talk to me. Thank you. Well done. Last but not least, is it? Yes? Yeah. yeah. I think for effect, should we shorten it by a minute just for the crack? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're. We need you there. Just get our, our slides ready. So we'll go back up to our up and down. It's our last presentation. Get the blood flowing. It's very important before you have all the lemonade this evening. Are we ready? 
They will be starting on the up for the hain. Do, three, car, cooey. Are we ready? A hain, a do, a tree, a car, a cooey. Gosta. Hello everybody, uh, this is Neil and I'm Pip and together we are co-hosts of the ALT Mentions podcast, unofficially supporting the ALT um, in creating a podcast about learning technology. So we are learning technologists and we are passionate about technology enhanced learning and um, we both really like podcasts as a medium. They can be a highly effective way to reach and engage audiences and communities. So one of the core advantages of using podcasts is that they are ubiquitous, so you can listen to them anywhere on a wide range of devices. Podcasts can be used to enhance teaching and learning in a variety of ways, and our podcast is available on Podbean and iTunes, and we've got eight, eight episodes so far for you to get stuck into. So what is the goal, ultimately, of our podcast? Well, we want to engage the learning technology community and have a wider impact discussing what is important to us and exchange those ideas in a public forum. And we do this in a number of ways. We started by having conversations just between ourselves and recording them. This is a really good place to start and that the, the hosts can build a rapport. So in terms of exchanging ideas, actually, I learned a lot from Neil just by interviewing him. So he talked about an education institution employing students directly to create a video uh, to develop their skills as part of an em employability initiative. So what else did we do? We invited a, a wide range of guests onto the show who've had some experience or involvement in learning technology. Some are longer interviews and some are shorter uh, episodes, such as um, we call them micro episodes, to get you started listening to our podcast. Over to Neil. Uh, yeah, so one of the guests um, was a software developer and he was talking about accessibility and uh, he just talked about his experience of using learning technology like PowerPoint and having the live translation feature uh, so it uh, engages international students. Uh, so that was really interesting to just get tips from people uh, about things that you might not have come across before. Uh, so what did you learn, Pip, from the guests? Well, there were three really exciting things for me. So the first was, what was the future of learning technology going to look like and feel like? And then to what extent um, we thought artificial intelligence would have um, an impact on learning technology and those jobs of the future, and what their favorite learning tools were and why. So we don't just have a podcast. We actually have an audio drama, which is, um, it consists of short monologues of um, a learning technologist's inner thoughts and reflections. It's called Telltale, bum -bum, and it's also available on Podbean now. So I'm just going to talk about what we did and our reflections, what we learned from starting a podcast. Uh, this came out of the ALT assembly in uh, February, where how can we um, help sort of engage the community more? And um, we started by going to a, a festival called the Sound It Out Festival, and it was run by experienced podcasters already. I went to a, um, a session on, it's really important to warm up your voice, do a lot of exercises, so you really get in the zone before you start your conversation. So that was really good. Pitt went to a session on audio dramas, which was the inspiration for Telltales as well. So it was really good to sort of get that um, professional expertise to uh, accelerate our learning, if you like. Um, in terms of editing, we thought, oh yeah, we'll just turn on the mic, talk for half an hour, might take another half an hour to edit, you know, take out the ums and ahs. Took about two and a half hours to edit a half an hour episode. Uh, so just bear that in mind. If you want to start your own podcast and you want to create more podcast listeners, uh, just bear that in mind. It does take quite a bit of time, but it's a lot of fun. It's really good creating stuff. And um, the software is Audacity, which we use, which is free as well. Uh, one more thing on that last slide, but... If you're going to interview guests, uh, just establish a bit of a sort of um, communication between what any sort of boundaries between what they want to talk about and stuff like that as well. So it just requires really strong communication as well. Um, so that was our journey. So in terms of the future for the podcast, we're going to carry it on. Um, we initially proposed it for this conference, but we're going to carry it on afterwards because we enjoy it so much. Uh, if you would like to come on as a guest, uh, we are also very interested in interviewing people, uh, so get in contact with us. Uh, but we're also uh, collecting feedback as well. So on our poster, uh, we've got um, a link to a feedback form, 
So we'd love to hear what you uh, think about the different episode formats. And we're also going to improve the sound quality in the future, which is very easy to do. And we also would love to do some cross-promotion with other podcasters. So if you do have a podcast, get in touch with us. Thank you. Brilliant. Well done. Well done. Okay. Can all the people who presented, will you just stand up for one second, please? The people, this is not easy. This is very, very high pressure. Ladies and gentlemen, they entered here today as presenters. They now leave here as gossetiers. Round of applause. Edina's work with Learning Technologies helps to develop skilled, data literate students who can change our world for the better. Teachers and students can develop and share coding skills with Notable, our Jupyter Notebook servers. Our Digimap services deliver high quality mapping data for all stages of education. Future developments include a text and data mining service, working with satellite data and machine learning, and smart campus technology.